Bobby, when you get into the ring and you hear the, 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 the cheers from your hometown, what does that do to you? Well, it's kind of like a calling, Bobby, Bobby. And I even want to start in too, Bobby, but I'm fine, too busy. I can't join in with them. And they make me feel so good. They've treated me so nice here. They're calling every time I start with the hard punches, they start right with that cheer, and I know they're there. I'm listening, and I hear them, but I can't get involved too much because I'm doing the fighting. Boxing is a sport filled with rags to riches tales. Hungry young men fighting their way out of poverty, their fists punching out a path to wealth and fame. But too often this tale becomes a cruel, full circle of rags to riches and back to rags again. For Bobby Chacon, his success came at a price. And when he finally achieved it, he had wished it had never come. Bobby Chacon was the eldest of seven children living in tract housing in Silmar, California. Raised by his mother and stepfather, Chacon had trouble with authority as soon as he hit his early teens. He ran away from home on several occasions and later led an all Chicano Los Angeles street gang who called themselves The Group. I used to run away to the projects and you go down the street a little bit and you could be in a fight in a second. It all depending on if you wanted to or not. But he changed his ways after he met Valerie Jin, a quiet, half Chinese, half Irish girl who transferred into a San Fernando Valley High School in 1968. The two became inseparable and after high school began planning their life together. Bobby went to work doing manual labor at a Lockheed factory while attending night school at Northridge Junior College. The idea of a boxing career was far from his mind until one night he sat watching the fights with Valerie. I was in a club and I was fighting all the time. I fighting everybody in my club because they were all booing me. And uh, so one day me and my wife were watching the fights on, on, uh, on the TV and she said, you can do that. I want you to go down and do it. I'm uh, fighting all the time on the streets. Club and be a fighter. I said, I can't do it. You can do it all the time. You go down and be a fighter. So I said, I, 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 so I told her I would. Bobby would enter Jimmy Flores' gym in Picoima, California, with long hair and blue jeans, and that's where he met renowned trainer Joe Ponce, who introduced him to the disciplined world of professional boxing. To give up a lot of things. You can't eat. You can't be a husband very well. You can't even be a father at times, because he's always in your training camp. Training hard, can't do this, can't do that. Got to follow all the rules. Boxing uh, got a lot of restrictions. It's just like a wife, too. And uh, my wife was jealous of that. Who was the best trainer you ever had? Joe Ponce. What was, what was the words of wisdom you remember most from him? What did he tell you that you remember more than anything? What? what? I, know, I, know, I, yeah. I'm trying to say, I don't know about how I say it. But the most, the most, and the best thing is no woman, no woman. <laughs> hey kid, no woman! <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, the old game. Uh, Chacon took to the sport like a duck to water. After a brief amateur career, he would turn pro in 1972 at the age of 20. After only a year in the sport, Chacon would win 15 straight fights before taking on former bantamweight champion Chucho Castillo in his first test that he passed with flying colors. Now nicknamed the schoolboy because his promoter found out he was taking classes at the junior college, Chacon was matched with the legendary Ruben El Puas Olivares. But the schoolboy wasn't quite ready to take on the master and took a sustained beating before being stopped in the ninth round. Tell us about your fights with Ruben Olivares. Oh, that, that man was uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Noro. He showed me how to fight, and that, that was one of the reasons I fought four times. And the first time, I, I said, where, 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 I looked for a long time, and he gave me this, and he gave me that. And I, I said, Joe, I'm having a hard time. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't hear it. He's moving, moving. And he knew how to do it. And I was so learning. So I, I, I paid him, and he had about eighty pounds, and I 
am 25 from my now. So I was a very good player. But Bobby would show resilience and show a remarkable ability to come back from adversity, which would be a recurring theme throughout his career. Chacon would be matched with fellow Los Angeles prospect Danny Little Red Lopez, who sported a record of 23 wins, no losses, with 22 of those wins coming by knockout. Over 16,000 fans would show up to witness an epic seesaw battle of wills. Bobby Chacon. People didn't know me because I was fighting for the form and Danny was fighting at the Olympic all the time. When we fought, they favored Danny because they had seen him more and they hadn't seen me. And then once I beat him, uh, things just took off. Four months later, Chacon would win the featherweight title from Alfredo Marcano and was on top of the boxing world. You won your first title against Alfredo Marcano. Describe how the feeling was when you won your first championship. It's still having gone away. I love it. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a featherweight champion in the world. And I, I mean, I'm the only man in the world who's a featherweight champion. I'm a champion. I feel great. Never better. Never better. Hey, how'd you know? How'd you know? Good I know. I <laughs> But the success came too soon, too easy, for the increasingly impetuous 22-year-old. He would fire his trainer Joe Ponce and gain over 20 pounds before his next fight. Trouble was on the horizon, and it came in the form of an old foe in Ruben Olivares. The schoolboy would once again learn a painful lesson, only this time it would be shorter and more violent, as Bobby would suffer a humiliating second-round knockout. The California State Athletic Commission was so disgusted with his performance that they would issue him a fine for not being in top condition. Without disciplinarian Joe Ponce in his corner, Chacon remained ripe for the picking. Six months later, Bazooka Lamone would batter his body and head for ten one-sided rounds, sending Chacon home a loser once again. After the fight, Valerie would take one look at his bruised head, now looking like a purple pumpkin and urged Bobby to never set foot in the ring again. Her husband's once bright star now covered by dark clouds, their marriage and lives being pulled down into the violent vortex of the fight game. Valerie Chacon. Boxing was something he was good at, but he's done it for long enough. I told him after every fight, please Bobby, please quit now. Chacon would announce his retirement at age 24, but the defeats to Lamone and Olivares pricked at his warrior's heart. He had to return. Coming back to the ring with a renewed resolve, he fought Ruben Olivares again, and this time, finally defeating his conqueror over 10 rounds. What what did you do differently that, that got you that win in that third fight? I learned. You learned? I learned how to fight. Because then I, uh, I'll fight him and I didn't know how yet. I was very green. Trying to learn the high fight, and well, I found I was I had about ten or more fights, and so I knew a little more. I should experience. Invigorated by this revenge win, he took on another former adversary in Bazooka Lamone, and in this go round, Bobby was winning the fight until an unintentional headbutt opened a cut over Lamone's eye. The bout would be declared a technical draw. But Bobby knew he won the fight handily. Bazooka Limon, tell us about tell us about your uh, your fights and your uh, relationship with, with Bazooka. Bazooka and me. I feel well, yeah, you know, because of all that happened. I'm sure he hates me. Yeah. The first time he beat me, and I was I went over there and told me to go to Mexico and fight somebody. I said, okay, I know who it was. I couldn't catch him, I couldn't catch him. And uh, so that, that was, uh, it went all the way. But I, I, I lost the fight because he, when they were him, pick him and pick him and hit me, hit me and move, pick him, hit me and move, and stay away from me. And, and I couldn't get him, I couldn't get him. Where is he? And I was bummed up. And that fight, 
Is it true that you guys did not like each other? Who told you? This rumor I heard. <laughs> uh, well, well, because he beat me the first time, he thought he could be any time he liked. And so I said, well, okay, punk. And I started not to like him too. And at the same time, I, I couldn't talk. And, and so he said, ah, he just lucky this time. He said, about well, me a third time. Same time, I mean, when I, I, took, I took it back, they called it a draw. How could they be there? I mean, I mean, every round, man. I know, I remember that fight. He got, he got lucky, huh? and they, they gave it to him. They gave him a draw because he oh, no, 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 I'm good, I'm good. I'm hurt. I can't see, I can't see. I mean, call fight off. And so they did. And it was called a draw. Did he ever hurt you? I can't remember. <laughs> uh, I must have heard me somewhere along the way, but I, I, I really can't remember. Okay. You know, I, never, I, I was always in the top shape room after the first time, and so he never heard me again. I remember one time I went back heads, and that's the time I heard me. Oh, yeah, those, yeah. Fans and promoters alike could see that Chacon was back on track, and his management team pushed the envelope matching him with a new junior lightweight champion and budding legend in Alexis Arguello. A heavy underdog, Bobby was cut early in the fight, but was ahead on points until Arguello hit him after the bell after round six. Dazed, Bobby was now an easy target for Arguello's hammer-like right crosses, and the fight was stopped between rounds. After these bouts, Chacon had accumulated enough in ring earnings to indulge in a lavish lifestyle. He purchased horses, Rolls Royces, and for this all too brief moment in time, Bobby finally defeated the poverty of his past life. Another rumor I heard, you lived a high life. Cars, fast cars, big houses, women, what your, body, what your trainer told you not to do. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Oh, that was a bad, bad part of my life. But I, uh... I was got involved with it all the time, and everybody told me, come with me, come with me, and I, and I went, and I went, and I went, and I went, trouble, trouble, trouble. Everywhere I went, I, I couldn't stop, get a stay away from it, because I was having fun here, fun there, fun there, and everybody was having a good time with me. That's why I, so I, I enjoyed the, the crazy life. And, uh, and I, I was young and dumb, and didn't know what I was doing. And I was sick of my life. I was sick of my life. And so I said about that. I love my life because of that. He would return to the ring in March of 1980, facing rival Bazooka Limon for the third time. He would win the fight, but lose the war, coming home with a Bradley bruised face and eyes that looked like rotten fruit. The win earned him an opportunity to take a crack at the now new junior lightweight champion, Cornelius Boza Edwards. Bobby battled the bigger man even for the first six rounds, but then began to tire. By the 13th round, he was forced to submit to the younger champion in a crushing defeat. Now both boxing fans and journalists joined Bobby's wife in the call for his retirement. Bobby Chacon. And I said at the end of 80, if I haven't done anything, or 81, uh, that I will retire. And I, that's when I lost to Boza the first time. So I wanted to continue because I felt that I had learned something from Boza Edwards. And uh, she had nothing she, to do with that. She said, no, that's it. You promised me. I told her I couldn't keep that promise. And... Jacone made peace with his former trainer, Joe Ponce. The two would reconcile, but this go around. Ponce demanded total focus. Valerie, on the other hand, was at the end of her rope. The pattern of fighting, retiring, and coming back was a vicious cycle that she grew wary of. She could see that Bobby was older and taking more punishment in the ring than he had when he was younger. Valerie Chacon. I had three babies at home, and I never got to communicate with a lot of people. I was alone a lot. I didn't like to go out. It was always quiet here. She had gotten him into boxing, but felt powerless to get him out. These thoughts began to carve a deep path into her psyche, and her mental health began to deteriorate. 
In February of 1982, Chacon traveled out of town for a training camp. While he was away, Valerie decided that her life had become an impossible balancing act. She would overdose on sleeping pills before being discovered unconscious by her mother. The family would not discuss the incident with Bobby until after he returned from the scheduled fight. She already had it made up in her mind that she was going to. I was gone those four days and they didn't tell me till after, but she was pacing the last three nights up all night long. Now why? Why don't I know these things? Why do they want to keep this stuff away from me? On Monday, March 15th, 1982, she kissed her children's pictures, locked her bedroom door, and placed the barrel of a loaded rifle against her head and pulled the trigger. Her mother would discover her body and call Bobby. Bobby had a fight scheduled which was only days away. Deciding not to cancel, he went through with the bout. Must have been a state of shock or something. You know, I just had to go through with the thing. It just gave me courage. We, we all lost something there. We'll, we'll all miss her for a long, long time. Amen. Maybe we'll catch up with her someday. Bobby would channel his grief into his boxing career, and after his wife's death, he would fight like a man possessed. Facing off for the fourth time against Bazooka Limon, the stage was set for a fight of the ages. The remorseless Limon warned Chacon that he would take sadistic pleasure in giving Bobby another beating. And he remained true to his word, treating Bobby like his personal punching bag. But Bobby was now well versed in suffering and coming back from it. He would be on the brink of defeat numerous times getting floored in the third and tenth rounds. Whoa, a hard left hand. Put Chacon on the seat of his pants. Bobby bounces up, but he was stunned. No question about it. The referee giving him the standing eight count, mandatory eight count, as he stands in his corner. Then it was as if something inside him clicked. He called upon an inner reservoir of strength and determination, fighting back savagely as if he were fighting the demons of his past and future, chopping at Lamone's body and head like a ruthless lumberjack. There were no choreographed combinations as the two soon became embroiled in a battle of wills. But only Bobby was propelled by the pain of his wife's suicide, and he displayed the stamina of ten men. And the tenth round. There's the right hand, and another right hand by Bobby Chacon. And a hard left hook by Chacon.
has it 142 to 141. That's Angel Guzman. All in favor of the new. It is the coach. But, Bobby, congratulations. Mazuka made a mistake. He come to my old town. I did the scoring, and they did the punching. Oh, don't talk to me about punching. I've never seen anybody throw so many punches in my life. Oh, my God, Shay, but here I am, 31 years old. How can a person that old throw that many punches? I just wanted that thing. 22 years old, and I threw it away. I had to get it again. And then uh, this is dedicated to my wife. She couldn't wait for me. But, uh, I'm told, Bobby, that you've gone through the toughest training period of your entire life for this one. For you, Bobby! Well, yeah, I went to L.A. to be with my, my trainer, Joe Ponce. I knew he'd get me in, tra in training. I couldn't do it here. There's no southpaws, and I just had to get in shape for this one. Bazooka me fought three times, and he has gotten better. No doubt. I thought you were going to get him back in the 13th. Well, that just proves where his heart has grown. He's fought some good fighters. I hit him like that before, and he was looking for a hiding place. I hit him like that tonight, and he didn't care. He was coming right back. He shook it off and came back. The cut came from the butt, did it? The head butt? Oh, we round. bumped heads a few times. Yeah. Uh, it must have. I really didn't say that was a butt. I wasn't going to say, stop the fight. I'm a, yeah. you know, like he did right. that second time. But... Bobby, you're the toughest guy I've ever seen. Congratulations. Damn it, I want to win. Okay, <laughs> okay Thank baby. You. Good to see you. Legal wrangling would strip Bobby of his hard-earned title as he opted not to defend against the up-and-coming Hector Camacho. Instead, he was offered more money by facing his former conqueror, Boza Edwards, once again. And once again, Bobby would take part in one of the most fearsome battles in boxing history. I'm looking to uh, a technical fight. This time it's going to be a completely different fight because I've been doing some revisions on the previous fight we had before. And um, to my knowledge, it's not going to be a hard fight. You know, when you got two bombers in there, people expect the, the fight to, to end real quickly. But the, I think he's very durable, and I think I've proven that I can take a punch or two myself. If we get hit, uh, we know how to take him, we know how to come back, and we're both in condition, so I think you're going to see a good 12-round fight. Chacon started fast, darting in and out like a world-class fencer, whipping lead rights into Boza's body like a striking cobra. He took the early lead, flooring Boza in each of the first two rounds. In the third, however, Chacon went down and began to bleed over both eyes. Twice the bout was called, and doctors were called in to look at Chacon's eyes. Each time, he pleaded with the doctor, just one more round. With blood running into his eyes, Chacon once again fought like a man seeking restitution for his wife's death. He charged forward in a frenzied search for redemption, fighting through a red blur of blood in his opponent's fists, punching like a man chopping down a tree until finally, Cornelius Boza Edwards. Cornelius Boza Edwards. Tell us about those fights. Well, he, he was very strong and big. He was big. And then, how's the one up there? <laughs> and he said, well, I'll show you. 
Hey, he's trying try to keep me away with that, that big long right, right to me. He ain't paying me this way. I'm not this way. I'm not this way. He was right, he was right, left hand. And so I go, okay, and let me try. And so I had a hard time facing him the first time. What were you thinking? Last round, second fight, you had to knock him down to win. What were you thinking going into that last round? Well, I'm in good shape and I'm gonna go out and do my best this round. And so I wanted to get him and I, that's, what I, that's what I did. You did, huh? Yeah. I went out there and I fought hard. I fought, I was in top shape. I had to be in top shape to be a good fighter. And I was, so I was able to go out there and fight him hard, fight him hard. Oh, 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 that's right, that's right, he's down. He's down. I don't know what he's down. He's down. I just stay down, stay down. Stay down. Here you get up. <laughs> Bobby would move up in weight to challenge Ray Boom Boom Mancini for his lightweight crown. But the champion would be too young and strong for now fading Chacon. His cycle of negative behavior would once again return. Only this time he would spend over three months in jail for beating his second wife. They would divorce and Bobby would continue to fight, although he would never come close to relevance again. And he would finally retire from boxing at age 36. But without boxing, Bobby's life would dissolve further into tragedy and poverty. In 1991, his son, Bobby Jr., would be killed in a gang-related shooting. By his mid-40s, Bobby would be collecting cans by the roadside, surviving on the charity of others, and beginning a slow stumble toward an abyss populated by too many former fighters. The now forgotten former champion would develop dementia and his roller coaster ride of a life ground to a halt in a hospice where he would die at the age of 64. Boxing opened many doors for Bobby and Valerie, both good and tragic. Valerie had written a suicide letter, but strangely sent it to Bobby's trainer Joe Ponce, who is also a film producer. Valerie Chacon. My dying will bring something back to him, and maybe they'll make a picture about me. I've got the perfect ending. I'm gonna kill myself with a bullet. Please be sure and give Bobby all the money. I look at those pictures, I see her smile. I see her doing something, I see her buy a horse, I see her with the kids, I see her hugging me, holding me. <laughs> I cry right now. <laughs> so much I miss her. <laughs> Take everything for granted like I did. I was here, Valerie was with me forever. <laughs> <laughs> 